Thank you for being here. I think everybody's got a seat, so we don't need to discuss that. Um, I only need to tell you to please turn off your phone's ringers. And I now have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Charles Johnson, who is the president of the Southern Regional Council. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to this 2017 presentation of the Lillian Smith Book Awards. I'd like to begin by kind of setting the stage. In the years after the Second World War, when the cries for national unity against international fascism were increasingly replaced with cries for racial and social justice at home, Lillian Smith was the most progressive and outspoken mainstream Southern writer on these emerging issues. When others were charting a cautious course on racial change and calling for a humane, more humane treatment of African Americans within a segregated system, Lillian Smith, nearly alone, boldly and persistently articulated an entirely different vision of a world without segregation. And today, with the benefit of hindsight, this vision of a world without segregation may seem an obvious one, but at the time, this vision was seen as fairly radical. For such boldness, she was often scorned by more moderate Southerners, threatened by arsonists, and denied the critical attention she deserved as a writer. Yet she continued to write and speak for improved human relations and social justice throughout her life. And so following her death in 1968, she died in 66 in the in 68, the Southern Regional Council established an annual award in her name to recognize authors, authors such as Alice Walker, and Pat Conroy, Alex Haley, and Pauli Murray, authors whose work carries on the tradition of Lillian Smith, work of outstanding moral vision and literary merit, which honestly portrays the South, its people, its problems, and its promise. For the last several years, this award has been presented in, as a partnership between the Southern Regional Council, which initiated the award, the University of Georgia Libraries, which housed the Lillian Smith Papers, the Georgia Center for the Book, which presents the Decatur Book Festival, and for this third year, Piedmont College, which operates the Lillian Smith Center in Clayton, Georgia. There are many people who have had a hand in bringing this event to you this year and every year, but I want to give special recognition to our heroic and distinguished panel of jurors who worked their way through the 47 books that were, <laughs> that were nominated this year. So let me recognize them because they deserve recognition. Formerly of the Atlanta Fulton Public Library System, we have James Taylor. From, from Georgia State University, we have Earl Picard. From Morehouse College, we have E. Delora Stevens. From the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia, we have Merrill Penson. And returning as chair again this year uh, from Clark Atlanta University, the Honorable Dr. Mary Twining Baird. So we want to thank you and thank you for coming and hope you enjoy the presentation. It gives me great 
pleasure this time to present to you the librarian of the University of Georgia, Dr. Toby Graham. Well, hello everyone, and, and Charles, thank you so much for your leadership of this uh, partnership. It is uh, so important to us, and we, and we take uh, so much uh, pride uh, and enjoyment out of it. Um, on February 4th, 2016, at the University of Georgia, we had the distinct privilege at our special collections libraries to host a launch event for Dr. Patricia Bell Scott's book, The Firebrand and the First Lady. It was a, a remarkable evening. A standing room only crowd gathered in an outpouring of, of support for one of the university's own. The culmination, really the celebration of 20 years of effort by Dr. Bell Scott. Her book explores the friendship between Pauli Murray, a human rights activist, and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, drawing on letters and journals and diaries, published and unpublished manuscripts, interviews. She gives us the first close-up portrait of this evolving friendship, how it was sustained over time, what each gave the other, how their friendship changed the cause of American social justice. The New York Times Review of Books called it a tremendous book. For the Women's Review of Books, it is a vivid, detailed, and compelling, and absorbing portrait of these two individuals and the era in which they lived. It's been featured on C-SPAN, is a Washington Post notable, notable book. Kirkus and Booklist called it uh, Best Book of the Year, and our distinguished jury call it a Lillian Smith Book Award winner. <laughs> Patricia Bell Scott is Professor Emerita of Women's Studies and Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Georgia. Her previous books include Life Notes, Personal Writings by Contemporary Black Women, Flat-Footed Truths, Telling Black Women's Lives, and Double Switch Stitch, Black Women Write About Mothers and Daughters. It was a joy to be with Dr. Bell Scott to launch the firebrand of the First Lady and an even greater joy to be here today, 19 months later, to present Patricia Bell Scott with the South Oldest Book Award and one of the most coveted prizes given in social justice writing, the Lillian Smith Book Award. I want to thank the Southern Regional Council, the University of Georgia Libraries, the DeKalb County Public Library, Georgia Center for the Book, and Piedmont College for sponsoring the Lillian Smith Book Awards. I thank Dr. Toby Graham, University of Georgia Associate Provost and University Librarian for his warm introduction and I thank Ms. Jean Cleveland, Communications Director for the University of Georgia Libraries for her part in facilitating the arrangements for today's program. Finally, I wanna thank my husband, Charles Vernon Underwood, who's sitting right up front, <laughs> and, and many of my friends and colleagues who are here today. Your support has been invaluable. I am deeply honored to be one of this year's recipients of the Lillian Smith Book Award. In fact, I am indebted to Lillian Smith on at least four accounts. First of all, her activism and support of Southern progressives, especially young people, demonstrated what it meant to be a woman of conscience. Second, her exemplary leadership as a white Southerner determined to fight for social justice on her home turf, gave courage to others who could not and did not want to leave the South. 
Third, her contributions as a writer of deep psychological insight was a source of comfort to those grappling with the thorny interconnections of race, sex, and identity to white supremacy and misogyny. And fourth, I am indebted to Lillian Smith for her kindness and the hand of friendship she extended to the two women who are the subjects of my biography, The Firebrand and The First Lady. Without Lillian Smith, Pauli Murray and Eleanor Roosevelt would have been different people. Lillian Smith and Eleanor Roosevelt were women of the same generation. They shared democratic values and they worked together in groups such as the NAACP, the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, the Rosenwald Fund, and the Americans for Democratic Action. The correspondence between them speaks of their efforts to mobilize women. For example, on December 14, 1943, during World War II, after discrimination in housing, employment, and the military had sparked riots in several urban centers, Smith wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, I've been trying for six or seven years to prove to white Southern women of my social class that we can speak out plainly about racial democracy, that we can take a public stand against discrimination and even against segregation. Like Eleanor Roosevelt, who used her prestigious post as First Lady to advocate for civil rights, Smith wrote again to the First Lady, I am known for my works with children of wealthy Southern families. I have a fortunate position in the South, and I have made the most of it. After the 1954 Brown decision, Few politicians running for office in the South were willing to publicly endorse the Supreme Court ruling, but Lillian Smith audaciously backed a candidate in Georgia who did. That candidate, a Grace Thomas, was an Atlanta attorney who ran for the Democratic nomination. Heartened by the prospect of a candidate who was female and who supported integration, Eleanor Roosevelt sent a contribution to the campaign. Thomas would lose, but in the end, Smith was convinced that the movement had made a small and important step forward. And on September 10, 1954, she wrote to Eleanor again. She said in that missive, the old rule has been broken a statewide politician did, for the first time since the Civil War, speak out for democracy and human rights. Her campaign will not be forgotten. My warmest thanks for your help. Maybe it was worth it just for the look that came on the youngsters' faces when they saw your check. Lillian Smith's support was vital to Polly Murray as well. It was to Smith that a young Murray confessed that she faced a heart-wrenching dilemma, whether to become a writer or a lawyer. I'm really a submerged writer, Murray wrote to Smith and her partner, Paula Snelling, but the demands of the period have made me, have driven me into social action. This was a dilemma that Smith, a writer activist herself, knew all too well, and she would offer Murray support wherever she could. For example, Smith and Snelling published the first version of Murray's epic poem, Dark Testament, in their journal, South Today. That poem would become the title work in Murray's collection of the same name. Smith read multiple drafts of Murray's family memoir, Proud Shoes, and when Smith thought that Murray's narrative was becoming too academic, she would nudge Murray to be brave. In one letter, she wrote, I want to spank you when you become the lawyer or the sociologist 
or begin using the technical jargon, which is not the work of an artist. So I scold hard, hard to jolt you. Please don't cover up your heart in your seeing mind. I love that line, your seeing mind. Feel it, imagine it, and all will be well. Eleanor Roosevelt and Pauli Murray were also impacted by Eleanor Smith's books. In 1956, during a critical period of Adlai Stevenson's presidential campaign, the First Lady sent Stevenson a copy of Killers of the Dream, Lillian Smith's penetrating critique of Southern racism. The First Lady did this because she was hoping that this would help to broaden Stevenson's understanding of the race problem. In the day before Murray had thyroid surgery, she lay in her hospital bed reading Lillian Smith's The Journey. Murray, who was overwhelmed with a concern for friends who had been summoned to testify before the McCarthy Committee, and she was also worried about herself, worried that she might be next, kept reading over and over a line, a passage uh, from The Journey. Smith had written in that passage, and it was all about fear, this passage, which I want to share with you, which says, but how hard it is when we are struggling with fears to think beyond ourselves and the present moment. Even the most responsible of us is not in a learning mood on those days, days which sometimes stretch into years, years when the quiet voice of reason is drowned out by the cries of the terrorized child within us. When Murray's elderly aunts died, she turned to Eleanor Roosevelt and Lillian Smith for solace. Murray lobbied the NAACP to change its selection criteria for the Spingarn Award, which is the association's highest honor. And that selection criteria requires that one be African American. And Murray, in her usual fashion, took on the chairman of the board, and she told him that it was philosophically and morally wrong that the Spingarn should be denied to women like Eleanor Roosevelt and Lillian Smith. In 1962, Murray paid tribute to Smith again in an address entitled Grace Under Pressure, given at an annual meeting of the National Council of Negro Women. She borrowed the title of that speech from Ernest Hemingway, who coined the phrase grace under pressure to explain what he meant by courage. It took grace under pressure, Murray told the audience, for astronauts to brave the unknown and open a new frontier, for James Meredith as to enroll as the first black student at the University of Mississippi under military guard, for Rosa Parks to refuse to give up her seat to white passengers on a, Birmingham, on a Montgomery bus, knowing that she would be arrested, and for Lillian Smith to write about the psychosis of white supremacy and, her, and align herself with the civil rights movement. As women of conscience, Murray told the audience, we have the responsibility of carrying on the great pioneering tradition of the valiant women who have gone before. In closing, it is with gratitude that I accept this award and pay homage to the support Lillian Smith, Pauli Murray, and Eleanor Roosevelt gave each other. May we be nourished by their writings imbued with their compassion, inspired by their example, and energized by their perseverance. Thank you. Good afternoon. Vagrant Nation, 
full colon, police power, constitutional change, and the making of the 1960s. That's a big order uh, to, uh, to talk about. Uh, and uh, we welcome uh, Dr. Risa Golubov, uh, uh, who is the Arnold H. Leon Professor of Law and Professor of History and the Dean of the Law School at the University of Virginia. <laughs> She has brought us a deep reaching, comprehensive account of some of the constituent elements of the developments of the 1960s. I have spoken in the past about the bravery of people who yank the tops off garbage cans to reveal their inner contents. Dr. Galyubov has undertaken to examine these contents, show how they were a part of loosening the grip of the law and then how many causes were afforded opportunity to open up for the benefit of U.S. citizens. I'm happy to be here today and grateful to the jury members for carrying on when I was unable to. One of the things I appreciate about the Lillian Smith Book Awards is the chance to read up and learn what other scholars are thinking about contemporary historical events and the yet untold stories that are being written. Some of these we lived through. It's like an annual postdoctoral fellowship to read in-depth analysis. <laughs> First-hand accounts, coming-of-age stories, biographies, autobiographies, confessionals, as well as all manner of poetry books and novels. Perhaps one of the things we most appreciate is knowing the details of how these things came about and how much work it took for that to happen. I think one of the discussions we were having earlier was uh, not only how long it might take, but how many people had to be involved uh, for them to be uh, put in place. Dr. Galyubov has written us a well-thought-out examination of how a long-standing, purposely vague law was changed to allow some radical development to take place and transform our society. We, the jury, the Southern Regional Council, the University of Georgia, and our other constituent governing elements uh, for the, this prize, are happy to award one of these year, this year's prizes to Dr. Risa Galyubov for her work and urge her to continue. Okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Mary. And I want to echo all of the thank yous that uh, Patricia offered earlier. I am honored in receiving this award. I'm honored to share it with Patricia Bell Scott for her wonderful book. My interactions with Lillian Smith are not nearly as deep, nor the interactions of those in my book, but I will say I have long been a fan of hers uh, as a writer, as a feminist, as a pioneer of the freedom struggle, and a social justice warrior. She is a model for many of us, certainly for me. I can't be a pioneer because those days are past, but I can continue that tradition. Uh, and I aspire to be all of those things, and she sets a very high bar. With my writing in particular, I think about how Lillian Smith changed the world and how she didn't think that it was incumbent upon someone else to change the world. She thought it was incumbent upon her. And it takes a lot of people to think that 
and to act on that in order for the world to change. And it's my hope that in the books that I write, I write about people who do that, like Lillian Smith, not necessarily as effectively or as publicly, and I'll tell you about some of them in a minute. Um, but it's also my hope that revealing the history, I like the, the notion of lifting the lid off the garbage can, uh, in revealing histories that we didn't know before and in identifying people who I think are also heroes, uh, that we can be inspired to think about what the world can be even when it seems so settled in where it currently is. Uh, and then we can think about what roles that we each can play. Often when we think especially about legal history, and I'm a legal and constitutional historian as well as a social historian, we think that legal change happens somewhere else. And most of the time we think it happens in the Supreme Court and that it is effectuated by Supreme Court justices. And one of the main things that I'm here to say, something Lillian Smith knew very well, is that that's not true. I mean, they play a role, I wouldn't deny that, and a very important role, but cases don't come to them without people who bring them. And change doesn't happen until people identify the need for it. Uh, and she knew that, and, uh, and I tried to write about that in my scholarship. So my book is fundamentally about how does legal and social change happen? How is it possible that in 1952, a category of laws that has been on the books for literally 400 years, coming out of medieval and Elizabethan England to the United States when they were colonies, how is it possible that after 400 years, from 1952 to 1960, those laws become illegitimate. It's the historical blink of an eye, 20 years, and they go from being used everywhere ubiquitously, ubiquitously uh, to regulate all kinds of people to being unconstitutional and illegitimate. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what vagrancy laws are because most people don't know. I'm glad to say most people don't know. Uh, and, and then tell you a little bit about some of the people who I think are the heroes of my book. So vagrancy laws that came to the colonies from England uh, and related laws like loitering and suspicious persons laws were laws that made it a crime to be a certain kind of person. Often a poor person, but not always. They made it a crime to be immoral or idle, or wander about with no apparent purpose. Uh, so there were two hallmarks of vagrancy laws that made them particularly attractive to law enforcement officers. The first is that they were status offenses. So if you think of most of our laws, you do something and then you can be prosecuted for doing that thing, stealing or killing, right? Not vagrancy laws. Vagrancy laws made it a crime to be a certain kind of person. So I'm going to read you the law that eventually came to the Supreme Court in 1972. This was on the books in Jacksonville, Florida in 1972, and there were laws like them all across the country. They begin, this one begins, rogues and vagabonds or 1972, or dissolute, I know to those of you who are young in this room, that sounds like a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. Uh, persons who use juggling, or dissolute persons who go about begging, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, common night walkers, thieves, pilferers or pickpockets, traders in stolen property, common railers and bra brawlers, persons wandering or strolling around from place to place without any unlawful purpose, any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons, shall be deemed vagrants not commit the crime of vagrancy. And I don't know about you, I live on a college campus, wandering or strolling around from place to place, <laughs> habitual loafers, right? These are things we all engage in all the time. So this sanctioned arrest by the police of virtually anyone at any time. And that's combined with the second hallmark. So the first is arresting people for who they are, not for what they do. And the second is this unbelievably broad and unlimited language. Virtually unlimited discretion to arrest anyone. You could always find a reason. And when I give you some of the examples, you'll see what I mean by that. So for centuries, officials employed these laws against anyone who is out of place in any way, and not just those you would think of as vagrants when I say that word. Vagrancy laws were used variously to regulate and extract labor from the resident poor, to exclude poor strangers from a locality and punish them, to incapacitate any threat to the social order, 
to prevent the commission of incipient crime, and by incipient crime I mean before a crime has been committed, to enforce racial segregation and subordination, and to discipline minorities, dissidents, and nonconformists of all stripes. These uses were ubiquitous and they were quotidian. But by 1972, these laws were unconstitutional. So in this 20 year period, these laws go from completely legitimate to illegitimate. And I say completely, it's a slight overstatement. There were people who before the 1950s thought they were illegitimate, illegitimate particularly those arrested under them. Uh, and, but most legal professionals, judges, lawyers, scholars, they thought they were fine, even though they were different from most other criminal laws. And not everyone after the 1970s thought they were illegitimate, especially those who deemed them necessary for public safety and who immediately began seeking replacements for them upon their unconstitutionality. But when the Supreme Court struck these laws down, they reflected a sea change in their constitutional status. They didn't create it because they were a little bit late to the party and lots of other courts had already struck them down and lots of police departments had already stopped using them and lots of legislatures were already looking for alternatives because it was clear that they were no longer compatible with basic American values. But the Supreme Court's imprimatur made that very, very clear. So the question of my book is how did that change happen? And Lillian Smith is very much alive here when I say it's because people, regular people, everyday people, acting alone, acting in groups, acting in social movements, acting with the help of lawyers, and I'll tell you about some of them as well, made that change. So let me tell you about a few of these people. There was Isidore Edelman, who was a soapbox orator in Los Angeles' Pershing Square in the late 1940s. He had communist views, though he'd been kicked out of virtually every organization he'd ever joined, including the Communist Party. <laughs> but for his communist views in Cold War America, he was arrested 63 times in quick succession. And because of those arrests, he was then arrested for vagrancy, for being a dissolute person. He had committed crime, therefore he was lawless, dissolute, and a vagrant. There was a nine-day trial for Isidore Edelman and his vagrancy charge. And his was the first case that came up to the Supreme Court for them to start thinking about whether vagrancy laws were unconstitutional. But in 1952, they couldn't quite figure it out yet and they didn't answer the question then. And in fact, they saw more than a dozen cases between 1952 and 1972 before they finally wrapped their minds around this problem and struck it down. Another person is a man known as Shuffling Sam Thompson. Sam Thompson was a handyman and a junk peddler. He was also an alcoholic. He was an African-American man who lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and suffered constant police harassment, usually at the Louisville bus station where he had to go to get his, uh, a ride to his home on the outskirts of town. He stopped going to the Louisville bus station when his counsel suggested that he not. And he went to a black bar near a bus stop and I can't make this up, the bar was at the corner of Liberty and West Streets, at the end of Liberty Street, and it was called the Liberty End Cafe, where the cops went looking for him and arrested him for loitering for the 55th time while he shuffled his feet to the jukebox and ate some macaroni. There was, and this is probably the only person uh, any of you have heard of on my list, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was described, quote, as a notorious person in the field of civil rights in Birmingham in his Supreme Court case on this issue. He was a co-founder with Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he was arrested for loitering, for refusing to vacate a street corner on which he was talking with a few colleagues during a boycott of downtown department stores in his hometown of Birmingham in the spring of 1962. He paused between 12 seconds and a minute or two for that conversation. There's also Joy Kelly, a young white hippie in Charlotte, North Carolina, who rented a house as a crash pad for her hippie friends. They suffered police harassment all hours of the day and night, and finally the police arrested 18 people who were in the house for vagrancy, including Joy herself, while in the house for which she had to, a lease. And she was told that if she ever returned to the house, she would be arrested again. There's Stephen Wainwright, a Tulane law student who was unlucky enough to resemble a murder suspect when he went out for a bite to eat in the French Quarter. The murder suspect was white and young like him and had a tattoo on his arm that said, born to raise hell. The police asked him to bear his arm on the street and he refused, in part as a law student, he knew his rights or so he thought. He was a little belligerent about them perhaps. Uh, he raised hell. Uh, but also, he, he didn't want to bear his arm and when he refused, though they were looking for a murderer, they arrested him 
for vagrancy. And then there's Martin Hershorn, who had dressed as a woman since he was 17 years old. He was a hairstylist in Manhattan, and the police found him in the hotel room in which he lived, wearing only a half slip and a brassiere, and arrested him under an old New York state law that made anyone masquerading in public so as to conceal their identity a vagrant. Leave aside that he was not in public. Leave aside, as his lawyers argued in one of the first uh, gender identity cases on record, that he was actually expressing his identity rather than concealing it by dressing in what he viewed as his true gender. <laughs> These folks are obscure. They are not famous. They are unconnected, and they are very different from one another. They're white and black, they're men and women, they're arrested in public and private for political protests and for seeming like a murderer. They're arrested for their sexuality, their gender identity, their poverty, or their long hair. The constitutional claims that they made in the cases that followed were also very different from one another. They were about free speech and association, about the rights of criminal defendants, about cruel and unusual punishment and involuntary servitude, about race and poverty discrimination, privacy, and other fundamental rights. Their differences show the kaleidoscope that was vagrancy regulation, its ubiquity and its flexibility, its use as an ever-present police tool to keep people in their imagined places. There's no coincidence, and you might already have been thinking about this in the subtitle of my book that Mary mentioned, that they represented most of the progressive social movements of the 1960s. African Americans and other civil rights activists, communists, labor union members, poor people, beats, hippies, gay men, lesbians, and other sexual minorities, women, Vietnam War protesters, student activists, young urban minority men, and other dissidents. Folks who had been regulated by vagrancy laws were now organized, they were assertive, and they had lawyers. And what they realized was that vagrancy laws were obstacles to their other goals, whether their goals were about sexual freedom, racial equality, or political protest. So this is not a coincidence. If you cannot walk down the street as yourself in order to attain the other goals for which you strive, then those other goals are pretty hard to vindicate. Another way of putting this is the growing realization at this time that police officers and executive officials, as much as legislatures and laws, hindered the social movements of the 1960s and equally required intervention. Of course, the lived experience of the law, I was thinking about this as you were talking about the Lillian Smith, Polly Murray uh, interaction about, don't go to that legal jargon, right? Speak here. Well, the legal jargon's the way the lawyers do it, right? And in fact, it amplifies the voices of these regular people. So my book, as much as my book is about uh, the individuals who put social change into motion, it is also about the lawyers who heard them and who took their cases and who understood that the law was changing and this had to be a part of that change. When I first started uh, writing my book, I, uh, I, was, I was miffed because I couldn't find the single lawyer or the single organization who propelled this as a legal reform movement. And I had in mind, as I'm sure many of you do, Brown versus Board of Education and the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall and a vision and a prosecution of that vision on the road to Brown. And my first book I actually wrote about how that's oversimplified and there wasn't one road and there were many paths and choices were made about those paths, but there was still a core uh, idea uh, that, uh, that the NAACP led there. And I never found that here. What I found here instead were lawyers, some uh, affiliated with the NAACP, some affiliated with the ACLU, some with other organizations, some on their own, all over the country, coming up against this problem, realizing that it was a problem, and trying to write litigation, bring litigation, and write briefs, and advocate for their clients about it. And at first I thought, it can't be as important if there wasn't a legal reform movement that looked like Brown. And then I realized that there are ways in which, I wouldn't say more important, but how valuable this was. This problem became so apparent to so many different people because of all of the social movements that were happening at the time. And it's actually quite empowering in a Lillian Smith kind of way to say each of us has this power and every lawyer has this power and we each have the power to put this in motion because we can reach out to any lawyer. And it's not only Thurgood Marshall and it's not only the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, 
ground that is able to make change. Uh, so I, I'll mention just a couple of the lawyers. I want to finish. Uh, I don't want to go on too long. Um, but as a teacher of lawyers and now as the leader of an institution that produces lawyers, um, I can't help but say the lawyers are a key part of the story. They do put it in legal jargon. They make the lived experience of the law and the oppressions of the law cognizable to other lawyers and legal professionals, to legislators and to judges. Uh, and they uh, bring people into the formal mechanisms of the law and enable that change to happen. So these were people like A.L. Weirin and Fred Okrand, who represented Isidore Edelman, our soapbox orator. They were affiliated with the Southern California ACLU. As early as the 1930s, Al Weirin was representing farm workers who were arrested for vagrancy when they tried to organize against California growers. Think Grapes of Wrath. As late as 1983, Fred Okrand was involved in a United States Supreme Court decision striking down a California loitering law that replaced its older, more traditional vagrancy law that was used against an African-American man who frequently walked around white neighborhoods and was arrested for being out of place. So between them, Al Weirin and Fred Okrin spanned 50 years of vagrancy legislation and litigation. Or meet Ernest Bessick, who was the head of the Northern California ACLU. He and uh, his southern uh, counterparts had lots of fights about where north ended and south began. Uh, and where they, where Weirin and Okren faced different kinds of vagrancy defendants at different times, Bessig in the 1950s was simultaneously fielding complaints from the Beats, from African Americans, and from gay men and lesbians. And he was one of the people who first recognized wow, this law, it's used for everything, right? And started to think systematically about it. Uh, and he had all these file folders, which was what helped me think systematically about it and ask the question, who did come under this law? How was it used? And how did people start to organize against it? And the last person I'll mention is Anthony Amsterdam who published a paper on why vague laws like vagrancy laws were unconstitutional while he was still a law student. It is still one of the most cited law review articles ever published today. I tell this to my law students all the time. Uh, he says he wrote it in two weeks at the end of his third year of law school, which I believe. Uh, and it's quite remarkable. But immediately upon graduation, uh, uh, Jack Greenberg reached out to him and said, hey, I, I think your article can help us with all of these uh, sit-in demonstrators and protesters that we're defending against these vague laws. And Anthony Amsterdam became a kind of adjunct to the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, although he was also uh, a law professor for his life. And he brought his vagrancy expertise to bear in the civil rights struggle for Vietnam War protesters uh, and in uh, criminal procedure cases. So he also was one of the real sinews that linked uh, all of the various defendants uh, together. So what the book does at the end of the day is construct a history of vagrancy laws and their downfall and then uses that history as a lens into the history of the 1960s and all of the different people and movements that made the changes that we all associate with the 1960s happen. And in telling those stories, I move from the people who experienced the law to the people who advocated for them to the judges who decided the cases uh, and back again. Uh, and I ultimately show, I hope, this is my goal, that the vagrancy laws were a key part of the maintenance of the establishment that existed and that their fall was a key part of changing what that looked like and enabling people to choose their own places rather than be put in places by that establishment. So the pivotal moment comes in 1972 with that uh, uh, ordinance that I read to you before in a case called Papa Christ v. City of Jacksonville. And there were eight different defendants in that case, but I want to talk about four of them. Two were white women and two were African American men. And they were out on the town in 1969 together in a car in Jacksonville. And they got pulled over and they were charged. And on the arrest sheet, it says that they were charged with vagrancy for prowling by auto. Now, had that been in the ordinance, I would have read it to you. It was not in the ordinance, but no one cared because that was the nature of vagrancy laws. And in fact, someone called Margaret Papa Christou's parents from the police station and said, did you know that your daughter was out with a Negro tonight? So it was clear why they were pulled over. And in 1969, two years after Loving versus Virginia, it was clear that anti-miscegenation laws were unconstitutional and the police were using vagrancy laws as a stand-in to do the kind of racial regulation that they couldn't do directly. Justice William O. Douglas wrote the opinion 
Uh, he had long fancied himself a kind of vagrant himself. He tells stories that may or may not be apocryphal in his various memoirs about riding the rails with the hobos and the industrial workers of the world, about singing Woody Guthrie songs and Hallelujah, I'm a Bum. He did have uh, vagrancy folders in his file, and I can attest, this is not apocryphal, that he was an honorary member of the Hobos of America, which named him a Knight of the Open Road, and whose correspondence he meticulously kept. His opinion reads as something of an anthem for the 1960s. He had been watching vagrancy laws and the challenges to them for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and when this moment comes, he makes the most of it. And after almost 40 years as Supreme Court Justice, this was the opinion that he wanted read at his funeral. And to me, that really encapsulates how much vagrancy was about this shift that happens in the 1960s. At the end of the book, I address in broad strokes what has changed and not changed since then. And I won't go into that here. But I will say, I've been thinking a lot about it lately, and I've talked to a number of you about it today. Uh, and that's especially because I am the dean of the law school at the University of Virginia, and my home is Charlottesville. Uh, and I imagine you all know what I mean when I say that, and my son is here with me today, and he certainly knows as well. When you watch groups of people spewing hate and intolerance identify themselves as the new free speakers, and seek police protection. It really turns the way I think about my book and the relationship between police and protesters on their head. Uh, and it has been shocking and jarring to think about how my book applies uh, in this day and age. And I'm still working to assimilate it with what I already know. And I vacillate between, at a, at a high level of generality, two things. Thinking, one, that this moment these people, this event, and the events like them, like it, that have been happening across the country, are a late and ultimately futile protest to a society that has undergone fundamental change for the last 60 years in fits and starts and incompletely, to be sure, to create the equality that Lillian Smith dreamt of. But on the other hand, I worry, this is number two, that this is not the case and that we are seeing the beginning of a new movement that might gain strength to undermine what we have already accomplished and what she and millions of others have been fighting for. And either way, it's my hope that Vagrant Nation in the tradition of Lillian Smith and the work of Lillian Smith, Eleanor Roosevelt, Pauli Murray, Patricia Bell Scott, and all those I've mentioned today, plus so many more, teaches us that each of us has a role to play in making the future we want to see, in shaping the law, in creating equality, and in treating each other with the full humanity that we all deserve. And I, for one, stand ready to do just that. And I know that many of you, with Lillian Smith fresh in our minds, will stand ready as well. Thank you. Can anybody tell me if we have any time for questions? Since nobody has said no, wrap it up, wrap it up. Will you, five, all right, but anybody, any questions? No, yes. One of the things that um, I feel like I learned as I worked on Pauly's life, 
trying to understand her life and the friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt is um, how they how they, what they got from each other. So that this relationship starts out with Polly being extremely impatient, in your face, um, far, so far to the left that she and Eleanor had trouble speaking to each other. Um, but the important thing about the relationship was that they never stopped trying to have dialogue. It was always very, very difficult over the, it, but they also spoke, spoke very um, candidly to each other. You know, these were difficult dialogues. Um, and that over time, what happened is that they began to converge in their political instincts. Eleanor started out, I would say, sort of center, almost sort of center right. And we think of her now as a really progressive woman. And I would like to argue that Pauli and there were other young people it, who became friends with Eleanor, who sort of pulled her uh, to the left. And Polly moved a little toward center, but she was never solidly center. Um, and, but one of the things that she gained from that friendship was some sense of the importance of perseverance and, um, and patience, because she started out being so impatient that if she felt that, I mean, she didn't suffer fools and she was usually smarter than everybody else. And so she would try a couple of times to get through the people and then just stop and go do something else. Bureaucracies tried her patience, which is why she was, even though she was a life member of the NAACP, they moved too slow, they were gradualists and she wanted to see dramatic change. But by the end of her life, she had reached the point where, after having started out as someone who cast her first uh, vote for the socialist Norman Thomas, and moved from that to voting as an independent in the Liberal Party in New York, she got to the point where she could stomach voting for a Democrat, but she always considered herself an independent. So, what I take from the study of their friendship was that Polly learned something about patience and learning and, and begin to learn to think that it might be helpful to try to figure out ways to work with in bureaucracies as much as you can. Eleanor was very much the tactician and the practical person. And so she would go pretty far before she decided, you know, I just have to leave uh, this particular institution. But I would say um, their commitment to dialogue, even if it was extremely difficult, was something that I think we can learn from. Uh, they never gave up on each other. The passage that you quoted uh, to me comes from Pauli's epic poem, D uh, Dark Testament, which she worked on for a good part of her life, for at least 20 years, and she would add stanzas as she went along, as, um, as events occurred, and, and then she would write a new stanzas. And she would share that with Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and uh, Eleanor would give her feedback. Um, and I also think about how Eleanor in one of the first correspond letters between them said to her, because uh, Paula was being really impatient uh, um, about uh, the, the school situation in the South. Polly wanted to go to the University of North Carolina. She wanted FDR to open the doors for her. And of course he did not. Um, and Eleanor said, well, the South is changing, but don't move too fast. Well, by the end of their by the end of Eleanor's life in the early 1960s, the woman who said to her, don't move too fast, is meeting in groups and violating segregation laws in the South. She's supporting the young civil rights activists, breaking the law herself. This is what the former first lady is doing. And I would like to say that part of, his, of that is this almost three decade long dialogue that she's had with Pauly, who has convinced her of the need to be an agitator. 
and how that, it may be slow, moves people forward. Uh, so, and when I think about the correspondence between the three of them, you know, Lillian, Polly, and uh, Eleanor, um, I think it really is helpful if we, and I was talking with some people over lunch today, if we can have enough patience to take the long-term view, what we may see as a real setback or as a blow roadblock, we may later on recognize it as just a stumble and um, that we will event that we event that it may be the turning point that helps us move forward more expeditiously um, so sometimes we can't always judge where we are and where things are in the moment um, the other thing that I take from this is how important I'm frequently asked how Polly and Eleanor would react to groups like uh, Black Lives Matter. And I think they would be very curious. I think Pauli in particular would be concerned, would want to make sure that people were not behaving in a historical way. She would want people to know what came before, you know, what were, what were the roadblocks, how did people handle it. Um, so I think that they would both want people to have an understanding of history as we move forward. And I've thought a lot about them. When I saw Charlottesville, I thought a lot about the two of them. This is what Polly lived through uh, growing up in, in Durham. Now I'm not sure I answered your question, but I, I thought I rambled a little. So in the interest of time, I, I'm getting signals over here. Let me just, uh, I was reminded earlier today that next year will mark the 50th anniversary of the Lillian Smith Book Awards. So we look forward to seeing everybody next Labor Day weekend during next year's Decatur Book Festival. Meanwhile, will you please join me in congratulating our authors and thank you. For So I failed to mention this earlier, but the two honorees will be available for book signings at that room, and their books are available over to stage right to be purchased. Yeah.